Let me ask you a question. Why doesn't this Gulmohar tree behind me reach out with this wooden tentacle and grab what is essentially a 70 kilogram snack of protein and fat? I mean, over time, why hasn't some tree or the other evolved the ability to do that? Sure, a Venus flytrap eats insects, but come on, let's ask the bigger question. Why don't plants move as much? Why are they, well, <coughs> rooted? Turns out that the deeper reason for this is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the molecule that helps plants turn sunlight and carbon dioxide that we breathe out into sugars. Essentially, sun's energy into chemical energy. And chlorophyll evolved at a time when there was very, very little oxygen in the atmosphere. We take the 21% oxygen that we have now in our atmosphere for granted, but that wasn't always the case. Scientists surmise that phytoplankton in the sea first figured out how to do photosynthesis. And they were so successful so fast that evolution didn't have enough time to catch up. So modern day plants, which all evolved from the phytoplankton floating around in the ocean 500 million years ago, are unfortunately stuck with one particular enzyme in this complex process of photosynthesis that slightly sucks. And why does it suck? Because it evolved to do its job in a low oxygen atmosphere. And we don't have that anymore. It's like plants inherited a Ferrari, but it came with auto rickshaw wheels. So what this means is that photosynthesis compared to other ways of getting energy is actually very inefficient. Meaning therefore, that plants tend to be slow. They can't just start moving and grabbing things like animals do, right? So this tree behind here takes months to produce this fruit, which I can take and get all of its calories in just a few minutes. But of course, plants haven't been sitting around brooding over their bad luck. They have instead invested in something else. Since they can't throw out tentacles to catch prey, what they have figured out instead is chemical warfare. Plants are the world's greatest biochemists and they defend themselves using chemistry. Think about it. Animals have evolved a million different ways to move and trap and catch prey. But plants only use chemistry to defend themselves. And here's the thing, that indeed is the chemistry of flavor. Everything that we consider flavorful is essentially plants trying to defend themselves from being eaten. This is also why organic produce tastes better than non-organic produce because any plant that's more likely to be attacked by pests of all kinds is far more likely to spend more on its chemical warfare budget. And that translates to flavor. And while that is good enough to prevent a passing cow from eating them, human beings have another trick up our sleeves, cooking. We use cooking to mitigate the effects of some of these nasty chemicals, and in some cases, turn them into things that are actually far more delicious. And that 500 million year old story about plant evolution brings us to alliums and its two illustrious members, onion and garlic. Their choice of chemical warfare, sulfur-based molecules that most animals find downright nasty. The onion does this with synpropanethyl S oxide, which is a volatile chemical that is released about 10 or 20 seconds after you cut into onion cells and it wafts up to your eyes and there it breaks down into, and I'm not kidding, sulfuric acid, which then your eyes take evasive action against. Yes, your eyes literally undergo a mild acid attack every time you cut an onion. And garlic, while it does not make you cry, produces a family of sulfurous molecules, including allyl mercaptan, which by the way, we cannot digest, and it passes right through our digestive tract and the only way the body gets rid of it is via perspiration and via breath. So we emanate garlic odors if you eat a lot of garlic. It turns out that we are so obsessed with sulfur-based flavor molecules that even the puritanical types who will not eat onion or garlic will still eat asafoetida, which contains very similar sulfur-based flavor molecules. And garlic is all over Ayurveda. The Bauer manuscript, which is estimated to be about 1,500 years old, 
considers garlic to be the panacea against all ills. But at the same time, a fairly significant portion of the population avoids onion and garlic. So it's clearly been a love-hate relationship over the better part of the last 3,000 years. Ancient Egyptians and Sumerians have been using alliums forever, and it's not surprising. Meat dishes made with onion and garlic have a much longer shelf life at room temperature than those made without onion and garlic because these are antimicrobial. So let's deep dive into the onion. Let's start with where most of the flavor is in an onion. Contrary to what you might think, most of the flavor in an onion is actually in the outer layers and not the inner layers. Think about it logically. The plant needs to protect its innermost layers, so it puts most of its defense budget on the outer layers, which is where most of the flavor is. So don't throw the peels away, collect them in your freezer, and then boil them once a week to make fantastic vegetable stock. The intensity of onion flavor depends on how you cut the onion. Cutting it along its axis will damage fewer cells. Cutting it across will damage more cells and release more of the volatile compounds that give you onions flavor. So if you're slicing onions for salad and you want a less sharp bite, cut the onion along its axis. Also, the more you cut an onion, the more flavor you release. And also with time, the more flavor you lose. One of the biggest lies on the internet is recipes asking you to brown onions in five minutes. That's not how it works. Onions have about 89% water. So till all of the surface water has evaporated, you're not going to get any kind of browning. Remember, browning only happens above the boiling point of water. Brown onions have a sweeter and deeper flavor than unbrowned onions, but you may not always want that flavor. So let the dish determine what kind of flavor you want from your onions. If you do want to brown your onions, remember that it will take anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes. If you want to do this faster, use the kitchen's greatest MVP, baking soda. Baking soda breaks pectin in the cell walls of the onion, and it also increases the pH, which accelerates browning reactions. A tiny pinch will get you really decent browned onions in about 10 minutes or so. Any recipe that tells you that you can brown onions in five minutes is lying. Now let's get to garlic. The intensity of flavor from garlic, again, like onion, depends on how you cut it. The smaller the cut size, the more the flavor. Mincing or pasting garlic gets you the most amount of garlic flavor. And a microplane grater is the best way to grate garlic to a paste. The process of cooking reduces the intensity of onion or garlic's flavor. So it's an optimization problem. The more you cook, the less the onion and garlic flavor. So you can either add a lots of onion and garlic earlier in the cooking process or small amounts of onion and garlic later in the cooking process. Also, our tongues are more sensitive to tastes at room temperature than at very hot temperatures. So dishes that are hot will taste less garlicky than dishes that are at room temperature. So you need to keep this in mind when you're tasting something that you're just cooking. An often underappreciated version of onion and garlic are their dehydrated powders. When you remove all moisture from alliums, you're left with a dehydrated, concentrated version of onion or garlic. And this is a trick that consumer food companies understand really well. Almost all consumer savory items have onion and, and garlic powder, particularly Maggi Masala, which is what adds that addictive taste to most snacks that you consume. Another common question is why does garlic stick to the hand when you're cutting? This is because mercaptans, remember those insanely smelly sulfurous molecules? They react with proteins on your hand and that's why they stick. The solution is pretty simple. Apply a little bit of oil and the fats form a layer between your hands and the garlic. Should you add onion first or garlic first to a hot pan? Consider this, the garlic has 60% moisture. Onion on the other hand has 89% moisture. Garlic will burn far more quickly than onion will. This is why it's common to add onions first to the pan and then add garlic later. 
And here's how you make the greatest tasting garlic butter. You layer garlic flavors. First, you bake an entire bulb of garlic in the oven till the insides are brown and just liquefied. Add that to butter. Then you add garlic powder and finally, to amp up the umami, grate some Parmesan cheese and top it with any herbs you want. And you will now be left with the greatest garlic butter in the galaxy. Another fantastic way to use garlic is to make chili garlic infused oil. Heat oil and pour it over chilies and garlic and let it sit for several hours. And then you will have oil in which all the fantastic flavor molecules of chili and garlic have been dissolved. Remember, spice flavor molecules are fat soluble, not water soluble. You can keep the garlic and chili flakes or filter them out. I usually keep them. And last but not the least, ginger garlic paste. Good or bad? Unfortunately, food is too nuanced for simplistic good or bad answers. So the answer always is, it depends. Convenience and flavor often have an inverse relationship. Alliums tend to lose flavor the longer they are exposed to air. And particularly as you damage cells by cutting them or making a paste out of them, any lengthy exposure to air will reduce their flavor. So a freshly made paste will taste far better than store-bought paste where the garlic was probably minced months ago. Preservatives slow down these reactions, but they also add other tastes, like sour tastes, which you may not like. That said, if you are short on time and making fresh ginger garlic paste is a huge pain, just go ahead and use the store-bought one. If some great Indian kitchen type fellow doesn't like store-bought paste, give him the ginger and garlic and ask him to make fresh ginger garlic paste for you. Thanks for listening. And if you want to dig deeper into onion and garlic, there is an entire chapter on it in my book, Masala Lab, The Science of Indian Cooking. I'll see you next time.